this was going to be a panel, and the point about being a panel was that um, I was going to try to get my individual team members to come up and tell you about their individual studies. For one weird reason or another, it turns out almost nobody could be here today. <laughs> so I will do the job for them all, and it'll probably run a little bit short. So I'll be happy to take some questions at the end and practicality issues and things like that. So let me tell you a little bit about where we're planning to go. So again, we call ourselves the Cognitive Analysis and Brain Imaging Lab, or CABLE, and, and I organize, not only does it make a better um, uh, uh, acronym than, than BICL, um, but it's actually Im important that it's Cognitive Analysis and Brain Imaging Lab because what we do is we use a lot of very well-established scientific knowledge that's been established over 30 or now actually more like 50 years in the study of cognition to understand how the mind, particularly how the mind works and how these algorithms of the mind and the, sort of the programs that are run, the representations that I talked about yesterday, how they work. And that allows us to do these much more highly focused studies than you would get when you use a standardized measure. Now, I want to always make clear the point that standardized measures are not bad things, they're good things. But they're descriptive rather than explanatory, so they're really a complement. One tells you what your strengths and weaknesses are and gives you this very powerful assessment. What we're trying to do is not do that, but say how have these things changed and therefore move towards what we call the how does it work information so that we can figure out how you change it. The analogy I always like to give is if you've got a problem with your car, you take it to the car mechanic. You generate a very elaborate description of what your car is doing or not doing. The car mechanic, because he or she knows how a car actually works, has that how does it work knowledge, says, hmm, that sounds weird. Maybe it's this system or it's this system. Well, if I think it's this system, I'll try this test or this test or this test. But if that doesn't work, it must be the other system. So if your car isn't starting, it could be you have a dead battery. It could be that your fuel pump is, is gone. It could be that your... Um, your uh, do the cars actually have these things anymore? Yeah, that's all very changed from when I took cars apart. But you know, your spark plugs could be disconnected and on and on and on. So you have to run a bunch of tests, but you have to know how a car actually works, what the mechanisms inside the car are, so you can figure out the right diagnostic test and figure out the right information. You need the how does it work information about how the system is created and how it actually functions. And that's what these cognitive analyses are all designed to do. The brain imaging part is wonderful and interesting and generates some pretty cool pictures, but we still are really in the very infancy of understanding how the structure and function of the brain really do relate to the cognitive systems in the mind. And a, and a very important thing I want you to take away when you think about this is it's very, very easy for us, particularly as scientists, to slip into the mode of saying, this part of the brain does this, this part of the brain does that, and so on and so forth. Now, that's because there's quite a lot of evidence that when somebody, a typically developed, usually a typically developed adult, because most of the studies have been done with typically developed adults, pretty much college kids, because those are the ones you can drag off the street and stick in the scanner, but not always. But when a typically developed adult does something with their mind, then their brain tends to do something associated with that. Okay? It's a correlation that this activity produces this activity and this activity in the mind produces that activity in the brain as we can tell by functional imaging. Or if you damage this part of the brain, you damage that part of the mind. Now the difference between that is these are typically developed people who all things being equal have been through a relatively similar history. No two people's brains are the same, so in fact there's an enormous amount of variation. For those people who played the violin from four years of age have a completely different brain from people who never played the violin. And in fact people who've had an entire hemisphere of their brain taken out because of intractable epilepsy can pretty much appear completely normal and pass all of the standard psychological tests, but they will all have been shifted to the other side of their brain. So when when you have an atypical development, the brain will be completely differently organized. Okay? So we really don't know that this part should be doing that part. Or really, no one part of the brain does any one thing. There's a dynamic construction of systems. So we're still a little bit in the dark. We're trying to relate what we see in the brain to what we know a lot more about in cognitive analysis. So our, our lab is really driven by a lot of theorizing from cognitive analysis that we can really do. I don't mean analysis in the psychoanalysis sense, but really in the almost computer programming sense, because we can look at it in that terms. And then trying to understand how the brain has changed. So let me tell you about our major studies. So our major flagship study, so you'll hear me refer to the R01, and the reason I use this slip into this language, this is NIH speak. So they have different kinds of grants. This is a research grant, and it's the main one, so it got the, the 01 assignment, okay? So 
when I mention across the rest of these R01. So um, this is not the label that the NIH has, but we call this brain development and learning difficulties in chromosome 20Q11.2 deletion syndrome. We have run uh, now six full years of research on this project, and most of the results I showed you came from that. And um, as I mentioned, uh, which I was very excited about, after a mammoth struggle with the NIH, <laughs> we finally just got approved our next five years. In fact, we came out in the top 3% of all the grants submitted in several cycles. So uh, I recognize. Thank you. Uh, it, was, <laughs> it was quite a process. Um, it, it produces for us $2.6 million in what are called direct costs. So we actually, every dollar that we get from the NIH, the university gets about 53 cents because they actually provide the buildings and the electricity and the phones and the MRI scanner and all the other kind of things. And so we hope to get uh, started in July 1st. The only problem we're facing right now, if you've been listening to the radio, is the government doesn't actually have a budget right now. Um, and so they're sort of guessing. Um, they're on a continuing resolution. So when the budget is actually passed, the NIH will know what its real budget actually is, and then we might have to take a big gulp and see what we really end up with. So, but that's, that's effectively what, what's planned. Now, that seems like a colossal amount of money, but actually it's cut really fine to the bone. What it's actually going to do is pay for the personnel on this project, and we're bringing some absolutely world-class personnel onto the study. So, for example, the research director of the Mind Institute here is one of the most world-famous neuroanatomists uh, walking the planet at the moment, and he's coming on to the project to help us really analyze where certain parts of the brain are so that we can actually really measure them accurately. Uh, and then some other people who are just incredibly uh, um, prominent in their different areas are going to help us build really cutting-edge, state-of-the-art tools. The other big thing is it costs us $678 per hour for an MRI scan at this point. And we need about an hour and a half's time at the scanner. We only do about 40 minutes worth of scanning, but it takes an hour and a half's time in the scanner. So when we bring you from across the country, um, and it costs us nowadays a couple of thousand dollars generally to bring you and your child across the country, and it costs a thousand dollars to do a MRI scan, and then we're hiring the other folks here to do the other kinds of assessments. The multiplier effect when we've got several hundred kids in the study is really huge. So. We're actually barely making it even on what we do get. So, um, so but it, you know, it will allow us to do some fairly serious science on this. And as I mentioned yesterday, we hope to re-recruit many of the past participants that we've had. What that means is we're, we're sticking again to 7 to 14 years of age. And the reason we're sticking to 17, 7 to 14 years of age for now is that the last five or six years went from a completely, when we started, we were in a completely exploratory mode. No one had really ever done these kinds of studies on this disorder at all. And now we have a really, uh, I think, sound and, and, uh, and well-validated set of hypotheses that may turn out to be a really strong theory. Pretty much what I laid out yesterday very quickly. So the question now is, are we right about that? And the best way to be sure whether we're right about it is to go back and test that in the very same age group of children that we have so we can actually use our old data and link them to our new data. Um, and so most children <clears throat> were, everyone was between 7 and 14 years of age before. Obviously the ones who were 14 are going to be too old now to come back. But the ones who are younger, we'll try to bring them back because what we'll be able to do is actually look and see whether aspects of the brain have changed over that time. No one's ever studied that either. Does the brain change at all between one time and another? It doesn't look to me that there is any particular uh, short-term change that, that's dramatic in any way, shape, or form, but no one's ever measured it. So for, to the extent that we can bring back people we, we've brought back before, um, we will do that. And so we really want to try to establish this new brain and cognition basis for the, uh, for the study. Uh, for, for the disorder and move to the, the support of uh, developing new interventions. So I don't have time to go into enormous detail, I talked about it yesterday, but really what I'm trying to do with this next round is to say, look, we came up with a set of ideas about what might be the basis of a lot of the cognitive impairments that we're having. It really does seem like this is in fact what's going on. So now what we want to do is, is measure that in really explicit terms. So what we're going to actually be able to do in this study is take a whole range of spatial and temporal thinking abilities and put your child through a lot of very fun video games with some extremely expensive equipment. <laughs> One of our pieces of equipment is going to cost us $50,000 just to track where your, eyes are, where your kid's eyes are going. Um, but what we're going to be able to do with that is actually measure their ability 
to, uh, to, to think in terms of spatial and temporal information and literally put a number on them. So it'll almost like being, you'll have your megapixel number for your space and your time, okay? And, and it's not like you can then take that to your school and say, hey, my kid has a seven megapixel spatial resolution. They're not gonna know what to do with that. But what we're gonna know what to do with that is we're going to know how we can move somebody from one it's not really going to be quite like that. I'm analogizing. But from one place to another, okay? And so the interventions that we're going to develop will be targeted at trying to move somebody from one place to another. And those are going to start to get developed soon, and they'll be going along in parallel, I believe. So um, I can answer some more questions about the special a a aspects of the study, but it'll look a lot like our current studies. You'll come for the same amount of time. Your child will do a whole bunch of little short experiments like they're doing now. They'll be focused on similar kind of things. There'll be an MRI scan. There'll be some other things part of your visit, which I'll go through in a few minutes. And it'll sort of look and feel the same, but we're really going to be focusing on taking what I showed you yesterday and figuring out, is this really what's going on? And so that we can actually move to a sound explanation that says, this is why your kids are having these problems, and this is what we might be able to do to fix it. We're going to try to develop that how does it work information. So it's very exciting that we can move on to do this now, and it gives us a real long-term plan. So a lot of what's going to happen around this is going to be expanding the complement of these studies in a range of different ways. So one of them is that and, and as, when, I get to the, um, when I get to the part about the, the clinical aspects, you'll see, I think, a little bit how it all fits together, and I'll talk about that. But we're also, on this, we're also very interested in this issue that Joel talked about yesterday, of the risk and protective factors in the relation to the development of psychosis. And I think Joel said something very important yesterday. We have an incredible team of people here, led by another very world-famous scientist, Dr. Cameron Carter, who's a, who's a psychiatrist, and he's the head of our Brain Imaging Center. And he has a clinic called the Early, De Early Detection and, and Preventive Treatment Clinic for people at ultra-high risk for schizophrenia. And that's mostly people who have first-degree relatives with schizophrenia. And they are leading this whole charge, showing that you can, in fact, do early identification and reduce the prevalence and the, and the severity, so that you can really manage this in the same way that a lot of other disorders are managed as, quite, as a quite manageable disorder. And so when Joel said yesterday that the last group who were diagnosed at around about 25% may well be the last group ever, I think he's exactly right about that. And because we now have these kind of neurocognitive approaches, so psychiatry has dramatically changed in the last 10 or 15 years, and we often talk now about neuropsychiatry because we now can bring these neurocognitive analyses. And rather than just neuropsychiatry, we really have neurocognitive psychiatry. And UC Davis is an incredible leader in that field. And so that's what we're going to be doing here. Um, and Joel already described his study fairly, in fairly, fairly great detail yesterday. And so the point is, if you know, let me just reiterate the key part of his findings. It looks like a maximum of somewhere like 25% of people who have this deletion are converting to psychosis. But if you looked at his findings and you understood what he was telling you yesterday, about 50% of people that we've studied, no one has reported this before, about 50% of people have the, what are called the attenuated symptoms. That doesn't mean 50% are now going to convert. What it means is only half of the people that we're seeing with the attenuated systems have any chance at all probably of converting, which means that the other half don't. So this gives us a very rich picture about what is it in that profile that might make some of the people convert and some not, and might tell us just in the same way of the how does it work information, how we can maybe reduce that number and make fewer of them convert, to make them look like the ones who aren't converting. So basically moving people from that red end of the bar that he showed you towards the blue end of the bar. And that's the mission of this. So Joel, is Joel here? No, I can talk about him then. Um, <laughs> So Joel is, uh, we, we ha we're also really very lucky here. We have a very, very strong psychiatry department, one of the very best, although it's a very new one. And we, we're getting increasingly superb psych young psychiatrists coming through the program. What we do is we look for the very best ones and we skim them off the top and we try to create a very rare thing, which is a research psychiatrist, which there aren't too many of them. And in fact, there's only apparently 500 research child psychiatrists in the entire world who are, who are child psychiatrists, okay? So we're going to make one more. 
okay? And so I've been incredibly lucky to, to, to turn him into somebody who's already an expert in this disorder. So we're hoping we'll keep him for the rest of his career. And he's been actually given two research years. No one ever has done before that. He's finishing his research year right now, his second one, which is why, how we got this results done so quickly. Um, July 1st, he goes back to his, his final child training, so he becomes a real certified child psychiatrist, and, which he's already kind of halfway there but he gets to finish his training. And we only get about 30% research time. So this study is going to be at a little bit lower activity for the next couple of years. We've really done the first level of research. He's talked about it yesterday. We have a little bit more to finish off. And if people are still coming through, that he can squeeze into his very tight schedule because he'll have only 30% maximum time to do any research and do the analysis and get your letters out if you've been in the study and so on. So please be patient with him. The letters will take a rather longer. It's not a clinical practice. It's a research study. And He's got a lot of time to do other things. But we will be moving this along a little bit. These very important results that he showed yesterday, for the first time ever, I might want to point out, um, are going to be submitted any day now, especially if I keep getting on him the way I have to keep getting on him. And, and the, the data will collection will continue at a low level. But we're not going to be recruiting heavily, because he simply won't have the time to do it. And the results are exciting enough. What we're actually going to do over the next couple of years while he's finishing his training is look at how we can really perfect the study now and move it to the whole next level and get a lot more funding and keep him on for a long period of time. So we plan a very major launch of a research, what I look as a new, a new research program and a new research clinic over the next two to five years where we will essentially have a what I think of as a 22Q specific early diagnosis and preventive program here at UC Davis, most of which can be practiced through telemedicine. In other words, we may never even need to see you. We would like to see you at least one time, but then we could follow up through telemedicine. Um, and that will be our big plan. So particularly with the western half of the country, but we might be able to do it broadly. So that's some pretty exciting plans we have over the next few years. Um, <clears throat> and the other study that I want to mention, uh, well, one of the other studies we've already talked about. So um, in our clinical activities, we've, we've really understood something incredible. Because we've had this explosion, uh, it really seems like an explosion to me. It's been a small addition, but it really feels like an explosion to me, like a, an earthquake in a sense of how much it's changed our thinking. But since we've been able to add this extra clinical activity, to our research activity in the last couple of uh, months, actually it's been about nine months, we've really begun to understand um, some really important aspects about the socio-emotional interface of the kids with the world. <clears throat> and I was very lucky a year and a half ago to recruit Dr. Elliot Beaton, who's actually a behavioral endocrinologist, even if that makes even sense to you. There, basically the point is, how does your whole endocrine immune uh, and other system change under behavioral conditions? So you've probably all heard of these studies about, about uh, monkeys out in the wild, you know, fighting to be the top of the, the pecking order, as monkeys don't peck, but, um, you know, in terms of the, the, the power structure and the ones who are struggling to get to the top are under much more stress, and the more chronic stress that you're under, the worse your, your, uh, your brain and your cognitive system and your body can survive that stuff. So what happens if you have a dysregulation in the ability to, under, to manage stress, and you tend to be more stressed and more anxious all the time anyway? What is that actually doing to you? We actually did a study um, uh, before we submitted his first, uh, his first submission to the NIH, we went and we put in every search term about this disorder and this phenomenon that we could into the search engine that pr produces publications. You know how many results we found? Zero. There has not been a single study in this disorder of this phenomenon at all. And there's a very important theory that's been out for a short while called the allostatic load stereo. Actually, uh, uh, it was mentioned yesterday by Joe called the stress diathesis model. Basically what it says is the more weight you're carrying, the harder it is to move forward in development and the more, it the more stressful it is for you and the worse it is for your body. So if we can manage this whole stress regulation, we can get the anxiety level down and manage the stress regulation, it should actually have a lot of impact in outcomes. And it might actually out have effects on brain development, cognition, and the psychiatric outcomes. So this is a very important thing for us to focus on. Um, 
Elliot submitted his first submission recently to the NIH. He got an extremely good score for the first time through. I won't bother to tell you how this whole scoring thing works. It's really arcane. There's even a small possibility that could get funded on the first time. That never happens, um, but because of this little extra piece of stimulus money, the problem with the stimulus money is we don't know what extra added to something we don't know actually means, right? Because <laughs> we still don't know what the budget is. But there's a very small chance it might get funded the first time. That would mean it would start in July. And if it doesn't get funded the first time, I bet it will get funded the second time. So we should be on a, I hope, on a full funded study. This is running on fumes right now. Um, um, but we hope to be funded uh, by later in the year. Um, so it could be approved for funding. The data collection is underway. Um, basically, that's you guys taking away those spit kits, as I mentioned. And we already have our 10 families, so actually we got everybody. And the one thing is, I do want to mention, as I said first, it really is primarily we want to try to get the 7 to 14 year olds. So we may need a, a spit kit switch. Um, in other words, if you have one and your child isn't that age, maybe you can talk to the folks outside and they can trade it back with somebody and then we'll get you on our next list down. The point about this is we're looking to see how there's something called cortisol, which you can measure very easily in saliva, and it's a stress hormone. And, and stress hormones, when they're dysregulated, show up in the amount of cortisol in, in your saliva. And so we have a little plan where we're going to get your child to spit into one of these little tubes. There's a whole bunch of little tubes in this bottle. And we want to get them to spit into this tube at different points during the day. So in other words, what happens when they first wake up in the morning? What happens just before they go to sleep at night? What happens when it's a school day? What happens when it's not a school day? Okay, so the night before, the first thing in the morning. And what should you usually see? This is very well researched, but are we going to see the same patterns? We're also doing it here when the kids come right before they do an MRI and right afterwards. Because even though we're really, really good at getting kids through our MRIs, like 90% of them go through the MRI, well, you know, it's still not the most fun thing in the world to do um, for some kids. And so we want to see what the sort of the stress level is for that. Um, so, uh, so this thing is very clever. It's a very expensive little piece of equipment that we got. It's a plastic bottle with a top that has a, a very sophisticated piece of electronics built into it. When you take the top off, it says, oh, it moved, and it records the time. Okay. So when you take the top off, we know what the, when, the, when it was taken off. And so you spit into the first tube and you put it back, and you put the top back and says, oh, I'm back on the bottle. Okay, so we can record when it happened. Then you do the next one, and it records all of the times the samples have done. So we know you're not cheating. Okay, that's how we know you're not cheating. And then you send it back to us. We download the data from the bottle cap that tells us when all the samples were. We analyze all the samples, and we see what the regulation of the, of the cortisol was. So this is Elliot just asked me to show you this slide. So everyone feels stressed sometimes. Kids with a deletion can have some special emotional, social, and academic challenges that may add to their stress. We can measure stress and its health effects with questionnaires that are in that package too. So we want to know how your kids are responding, what you think about them, and samples of the saliva. And so you already have 10 of you with the kids. But if you don't have a child who's 7 to 14, please talk to Marisol. She'll be outside uh, in a little while and switch over. And we'll get you on our list for the next set, OK? Um, I have through to 9 o'clock, don't I, on this thing? Great. OK. Um, one of the really exciting things that's happened um, is that I moved here from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. There's a, is, is Donna here? Yeah. I don't know. When I left, I think there were seven or 800 families in the clinic. I don't know what it is now. It may be 1,000 families in that clinic. So when I came here, I thought, well, I'm going to bring my research program here, but maybe no one will ever show up, and I'll never be able to do a study. Um, but that really hasn't happened. <laughs> so you've, you've been incredible coming to our studies and helping us. And what's happened is, because of that, um, we've gained a lot of, of notice here. And we've been able to attract some really, really good students um, to the project. So my team is almost too big to manage. Um, so I feel like I'm the parent of about 11 or 12 people, and I have a four-year-old at home too. Um, but they're really great people, and they're contributing to the science amazingly. So one of them is a very great uh, graduate student who's in the team. Um, and her name is Heather Shapiro. And she uh, got very interested in this project because she actually has a history of being interested in the subcortical basis of cognition. And of course, as I mentioned to you yesterday, the subcortical issues of how 
uh, all of this dysregulation in development starts is what I think is the key to, the, to a lot of the problems. And it's really something that has not been focused on very heavily in recent years. The psychologists and the neuroscientists and the cognitive sci sci scientists and cognitive neuroscientists tend to focus on the cortex. The cortex is kind of the brain, it's cool. That's where, all the, where, the, where the big stuff happens. And we tend to ignore the subcortical stuff because it isn't sort of so cool and it's down there in the brain and we share it with lots of animals and stuff like that. And, um, so, but it turns out that this is really, really exciting stuff. And as I showed you from some of the, the pictures yesterday, particularly when we use our what's called our diffusion tensor imaging, where you saw those red, green, and blue images overlaid, we can do some pretty astounding stuff with this. And it's people like David Amaral, the research director of the Mind Institute here, who've been helping us do this very, very difficult uh, neuroanatomy to figure out exactly how to measure these things. Because so these are very difficult things to measure. Um, so we have some preliminary data already, and I showed you some of it yesterday, and it's very, very striking, um, and it's very novel. And Heather has actually um, really planned out her, her entire thesis work already. Um, she's already gotten some funding outside. It's quite possible she might get some more funding from a special training program here. And um, so she's actually doing very well already, even though she's very early on in the process. And uh, this, I think, is going to be very, very important and novel work. And interestingly, it lines up the 22Q deletion phenomenon with something that's known very much more about Fragile X, because in the Fragile X syndrome, where there is a quite a big overlap of the different uh, phenotypes, there's something known about the Fragile X, so there's this thing called the FMR1 protein that disappears the greater the mutation of Fragile X you have. And that affects some, cortical, some subcortical structures very much in line with the ones that Heather is interested in that are also very early on in that same attention system that we're talking about. And this is why we think one of the reasons that people with Fragile X syndrome have a lot of similar problems to those with uh, 22Q deletion. So Heather's work might actually integrate those two things and we might find that that's part of that common pathway, why, those, why these, these folks look so similar. So what will happen here is that there isn't a lot of money for the study, but it doesn't mean, that doesn't matter so much because we can recruit alongside the main study of the R01. So as your kids come, this is how we've made a lot of success and why I've been able to show you so many experiments in the last few years. There's only a handful of experiments in the actual main R01 study, but when we have postdocs, graduate students in the lab, we ask your kid to, in, to involve themselves and you involve yourselves in three or four studies at once when you come. And we, we do it all in such a way that we can you know, get your kid enough breaks and have enough fun and give them enough rewards that we can get a lot of these things. And most of them are playing games on the computer or getting an MRI scan and we share the MRI scans and do multiple things with them. So this will sort of really happen almost invisibly alongside the main study. And so um, that, that is the major set of major plan studies. Now somebody asked me yesterday, my child's 14, we can't do anything anymore, right? Well, that's not really true. So the 7 to 14 year old study is the main study. The um, Joel study is 12 to 22 years old and we will still recruit some people. But we're going to be bringing new studies online all the time to the extent that we have new people who are interested and we can find new ways of getting funding with small activities and seed funding. So I urge you to keep going back to our website and looking. And if we do get this video game project going, we may be looking at kids from a wide range. So how do you find out about all of this? I was actually going to try to get the, the website up here. But this is the website. It's really easy to find. The problem is, unfortunately, because of sort of limitations with the way that the medical center runs things, when you go to our website, um, the Mind Institute website, so you can go to mindinstitute.org, um, it's really a little bit hard to find our own website. But if you just type in cable.mindinstitute.org, it'll take you straight to our website. Now, we don't have a team of web masters who continually update our web page. It's basically us, and we're very busy with all of our research studies. So it's never as up-to-date as I would like. And particularly right now, because we're in a transition phase, the, st the stuff about all the studies is a little bit behind. But we have a breaking news section, which often gives you a lot of information. And then there's a resources section, which has a lot of great resources. And we link to CHOP, and we link to the VCF Educational Foundation, we link to all other kinds of places. And there's another section on the website called family meetings. And at that family meetings things, we archive all of the materials from these meetings, going back several years now. So you can get uh, download files of the slides of previous meetings. In the last year or two, we've been actually videotaping, as you can see everything. You can watch the, the movies of the presentation. So you can actually sit and watch them. You can point your teachers to those. Say, hey, you should look at this. Okay? And maybe they will look at them. Um, and so try to use that. 
and, and there's a lot of material. So come back and visit our website every so often. We'll give you news about new things that are happening and new studies that are coming all, along. If you're interested in anything about the lab, you have any questions about the lab, it's not a great idea to email me directly. Sometimes I'm away, I'm traveling more and more, and I'm trying to keep my email down. I get about 100 some emails a day, and it's pretty hard to keep on top of them. So we have a lab website, and it's cable, again, C-A-B-I-L, at UCDMC, that's the UC Davis Medical Center, ucdavis.edu. You should use this email address for all communication with our lab. What's nice about it is multiple people can read it. So if somebody's away, somebody else can read it. So we can generally get you a response fairly quickly. Okay? So these two things are really important. Unfortunately, this is not in, the, in the, uh, the binder that you have because I put this together, unfortunately, at the last minute. Um, and this address is on the front page of my presentation, but it seems to be kind of invisible because actually I didn't expect it to be printed in, black, in color. In, in black and white, it's pretty visible. So just cable.mindinstitute.org. If you go to a search engine, you type C-A-B-I-L in, I bet you it'll take you straight there. Okay, so that's another way to do it if you can't put all that down. Okay, I've got um, about five minutes left and I want to tell you some really exciting things about clinical activities. So we really have been able to do some very exciting things thanks to this, the Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities and also the, uh, the Mind Institute itself. So we are now finishing up a medical education video for parents and doctors. Um, Dan Commons here has been a tremendous uh, helper in getting this together, along with Kathy Angustiri, who's our current behavioral pediatrician, who you've, many of you have seen, and all the rest of the team. We've been videotaping the medical avals, the behavioral uh, and, and developmental peds avals, over the last year and a half, and we're going to put together a video, a DVD, which we're going to try to give to all of you. And it's going to be, it's going to have two versions of it. It's going to have a medical so we've been, we've been taping all of these things. We're going to create this DVD about how to manage the medical issues of chromosome 22 Q deletion. Because what happens when you go to their doctor? They say, huh? So the idea is we want a parent version. What should you ask the doctor to focus on? Because some people's doctors just are not going to look at this. So you look at it, and you can tell them what you need to look for. But there's also going to be a doctor version, how should I manage this child? And in the end, we'd like to have a really elaborate web version of this up on our website. So that if somebody's interested in, wow, I want to know about the immune aspects of this, they can click on the link, it'll take you to the NIH, you can look at their things, you can look at all the research papers, you can look at kids, you can follow the whole thing down. So we're going to try to make this a tool, so if your doctor won't listen and won't do this, you've got to change doctors, if you can. Okay, so we're trying to help you and support you as much as possible. We are going to present at the Society of Developmental and Behavioral Pediatrics, I think, later this year. We're going to try and give one away to everybody that's there to try to get that out. I'm going to try and make this widely available. So look for this sometime later this year. Okay. The other thing is what used to happen uh, when you came to our study was you entered our main research project, which was the R01, and that was pretty much it. We did a very simple research evaluation um, based on some standard neuropsychological testing for the research studies, and we, try we gave you a minimal research uh, ladder back, and some people found that very useful with their schools, but it wasn't terribly supportive as a major activity. So now what happens is when you come, we get you this developmental and behavioral pediatrics consult with a pediatrician who really knows about this disorder, which is, for most people, an entire life-changing event in its own sense. Okay. The other thing we're able to do now is we have Ingrid and, uh, as you heard yesterday, and Janice, who, another psychologist, who give a customized psychological assessment, whatever your child needs to explain the social, emotional, intellectual, academic strengths and weaknesses of your child and it's done based on what your child needs. This would cost you tens of thousands of dollars as a private consult, um, and we're able to do it now with support, actually, of the Mind Institute's money, um, which is running out fast uh, that they gave us. These develop reports, the family, that you can take to your doctor and you can take to your IEP meetings and your schools and so on and so forth. So now we feel like we're supporting you and we have a consult while you're here and we talk about all of this stuff. We develop strategies and we think about how we can help you figure things out and support you. What's going to happen next, if we can get all of our money, and this is the really exciting part, is we plan, particularly for those people on the western half of the country, um, because they don't have CHOP and they don't have Syracuse, and who have been in the research study, so right now who are 7 to 14 years of age, to follow up 6 to 9 months later with a telemedicine consult. So we want to have your doctor online. We want to have your teacher online. 
and we will be here with the behavioral pediatrician and the psychologist and me probably and we'll all hook up together and we will talk about what happened. So we will say six months ago we did these evaluations. Do you know what you're doing with this child? Do you know what you should be looking for? Do you know how to make accommodations with this child? Ingrid will talk to the teachers, Kathy will talk to the doctors, I'll sit there and listen. Um, and hopefully we can help to educate people at home without having to travel and bit by bit by bit we'll populate the country with practitioners who actually understand how to respond to this disorder. Now why is some in, in red and some in blue? Well, the blue stuff is funded, <laughs> the red stuff isn't. We have very small amounts of money so this is why I'm not usually one to ask about stuff but um, I really am going to ask you if there's any way you can figure out a way to help us with some of the stuff. Um, please think about ways you can do that. And we're going to be hearing from our advisory board members um, to actually uh, see if you can figure out ways to help us develop funds. The last thing I want to mention quickly is video game interventions. We really think that there is some science about how playing video games changes your mind and your brain. And based on what I showed you yesterday, I think there's a way to, in to put these two things together. I have to be slightly coy because I'm actually in a point right now where I'm dealing with some intellectual property issues because the university owns what's inside my brain. Most of it they wouldn't want, but this part they sort of do. Um, and so I've got to get it all cleared away before I can start talking too much about the details. But I really think that we can start working on this this year. I've been talking about it several years now. I have several partners and some people seem to be getting more and more interested. So it seems like there's some suitors turning up. I think we will be able to get started on the science and maybe we can actually start some preliminary studies within 12 to 18 months, which is really exciting. The funding options seem to be increasing and there's even the real possibility that these things could be tested both with and without new cutting edge still in clinical trials neurotherapeutic drugs that might amplify the effect of one another. We could be in a whole different world within a few years and this is really exciting stuff. So um, again, this isn't funded yet either but we're working pretty hard on it. So that's where we're planning to go and if you guys help us because you're our partners, if you don't come we're just sitting here staring at the walls. And so if you come, we'll work with you and we'll feed this back to you as quickly as we can. Okay, let's get on to the content for this morning. Um, so.